Good morning, crossover. In the house and on the stream, can you just get up onto your feet? Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. When I think, I think of your good, of your good, good and, and your love, and your love be kind, be kind, and I know, and I know your grace your is, grace giving, is me life, giving me life, giving me life, giving me life. When I see your favor, your favor over me, over me. Say, I'm grateful, I'm grateful and, I and I know my Savior is giving me life. Giving me life, and He's giving me life, exceedingly, abundantly, overflowing, overwhelming, more than I can dream. Say He's giving me life, exceedingly, abundantly. Here we go. Now I believe that you're for me, and I can see new mercy waiting for me every morning, giving me life, giving me life. Cause when I see your favor over me, God, I'm grateful, and I know my Savior has given me life. Giving me life, say he's giving me life, exceedingly life, abundantly overflowing, overwhelming, more than I say he's giving me. Y'all just give God some praise that you still have life this morning. The song just says, I've got the best life now. Living the blessed life now. I've got my best life now. Oh, cause Jesus, I'm alive in you. I've got my best life now. I'm living the blessed life now. I've got the best life now. Oh, Jesus, I'm alive in you. I've got the best life now. Living the blessed life now. Say, I've got the best life now. Oh, Jesus, I'm alive in you. I've got the best life now. Living the best life now. Say, I've got my best life. Oh, let's take it up, y'all. I've got my best life now. Living my best life now. I've got the best life now. Oh, Jesus, I'm alive. I've got the best life now. Living the blessed life, life now. I've got the best I've got life, the best now. life now. Oh, 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 Jesus, I'm alive in you. And it's overflowing. Overflowing. Over over more than I can dream. More than I can dream.
Mika. Yes. Oh, 
has a name. Breakthrough has a name. Jesus. Jesus. My hope, it has a name. Hope has a name. My hope has a name. Hope has a name. It's Jesus. Jesus. Run over God. 
fill me up, fill me up, till I overflow. Say, I want to run over. Say, I want to run over. So fill me up, fill me up, till I overflow. God, I want to run over. Let's declare that. So fill me up, fill me up, till I overflow. I want to run over. I want to run over. I want to run over. So fill me up with you, till I overflow. Say, I want to run. Come on. I want to run, say I want to run over, say I want to run over, I want to run, I want to run over, God we want to run over, I want to run over, so fill us up God, fill Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, Fill me up, God. Fill me Say, fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me Say, fill me up, fill me up, God, fill me up, God, fill me up, God, fill me up.
soul up in here today. That was nice. I like that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to those who are watching us online. Indeed, this is the day the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Take a moment and lift your hands. Take the hands of God. Father, we thank you right now for your faithfulness, your goodness, your steadfast love. We thank you, dear God, that we rose up this morning and we met a new mercy. So, Father, we receive all that you want to accomplish because every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, for whom there is no variation, no shifting shadows. Father, we rest in your veracity. We thank you for your faithfulness, dear God, and we give you the glory. Thank you for another day. Thank you for purpose. Thank you for calling. Thank you for help. Thank you for strength. Thank you for relationships. Thank you for all the good things you have done for us. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, a number of weeks ago, in another context, I did a message. And when I did that message, I got a number of responses from people that says, you need to do that to the for the church at large. And so this message is entitled, Time for Change. And it's based around 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, which says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God says, I would hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. Now, this verse is indeed a text, as preachers would say, this is my text. Well, this is a text, but it's a part of a context that indeed there are things that are happening in place that sets the stage for God to convey this reality. And so we have to do justice. If we're going to do the justice to exegete the scripture properly, we have to go back and look at the context of what is happening that sets the stage for this statement. And what is happening is Solomon has completed the temple. It was in the heart of David to do this, to build this temple, this house for God, this incredible edifice for the glory and honor of God. But God would say to David, David, you can't build it. You're a man of bloodshed. You're a man of warfare. You cannot build it. Someone else has to build it. And the assignment came to Solomon. And he built the house of the Lord. And Solomon knew how daunting this task was because his response is, who can build a house for God? The heavens and the highest heavens can't even contain him, let alone this house. This shall be a house for sacrifice. Get that? A house for sacrifice. Something is to be offered up that recognizes the value of God. And so Solomon engaged in the process of building the temple, and when he had completed the temple, we see in this context, he completed it, he fulfilled what he was supposed to do, and he built the house of God. And it was opulent, it was gorgeous, it had everything, the best of everything. 
Matter of fact, when it came time for the people to respond, to give their resources to build the house, Solomon paused for a moment and said, who are we that we're able to give so graciously as this? For all these things come from God and from him we're able to give. Even all that we have now is the hand of God that positioned us to give the bill a house like this, he says. And so he recognized it was the goodness and grace of God, the, the power of God that positioned them to build something that was so beautiful, so awesome. So it was a wonder in the land. But the thing that makes the house of God, the house of God, is the presence of God. You can have a beautiful facility and still not be the house of God. You can have everything in place and everything, the lighting and all the things are together and still not be the house of God. What makes it the house of God is that God is in the house. And so we see that the first thing that Solomon did upon completing the house was he brought into the house the Ark of the Covenant which represented the presence of God. And when they brought into the Ark of the Covenant, it says that the singers and the musicians began to play and sing. And their song was, God is good, his loving kindness is everlasting. What a powerful statement. God is good and his loving kindness is everlasting. And when they sang that song in union, it says that the cloud of the Lord came. The glory of the Lord came upon the house, so much so that the priest couldn't even minister because of the glory of God. What a powerful expression. So they saw the beauty and the power and the greatness of God moving upon this. And then Solomon came and it said he knelt down and he lifted his hands toward heaven. And he began to pray a prayer of dedication, dedicating the house of the Lord. And when he had finished praying, it said, the fire of God fell and consumed the sacrifice. Oh, what did, they, what did Solomon do? He prepared a sacrifice. God sent the fire. The fire, what does fire do? It cleanses, it purifies, it establishes a new beginning. What a prophetic picture that's being established here. We see that the fire comes down. In the New Testament, John the Baptist says, now, there's one coming. He's greater than I. I baptize with water, but this one who's coming, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so it's a beautiful picture of what was to come. The fire that cleanses, the fire that purifies. Here we see something here. The fire fell down. And the, what happens? The the ministers, the, the ministers of music, the, the musicians begin to play and sing again. And guess what their song was? God is good. His love and kindness is everlasting. That was their song. They loved that song. They sung that song. God is good. Surely he is good. And his loving kindness is everlasting. If you can get that in your spirit every day, that God is good. No matter what happens, no matter what you face, no matter what you go through, God is good and his loving kindness, his Hasid covenantal love is consistent toward us. And they sang that song and when they had sung it in union, then what happened? The cloud of the Lord came and filled the house. So much so that the priest couldn't even go in to minister because of the glory of God as God's grace and wonder and splendor was being manifested. Now, so you would think, what an environment that is. What an incredible environment to be in, to see the glory of God fill the house, so much so that you, you couldn't find yourself being able to function because of the glory. To be in a setting like that where you saw the manifestation of the greatness of God. You would think if you had a moment like that, it would never leave you. If you had a moment like that, you could never get past that moment because it was to be so fixed within your spirit. But we see something. We would see that God would speak to Solomon. He would speak to him that night and he would begin to speak to the fact that there is the propensity for us to forget significant movements and moments in God. That there is the ability for us to have an incredible thing that God does in our life and then turn around in another moment and forget all about it. And he says to him, chapter, chapter 
7, verse 12, it says this. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and if my people who are called by my name, and he gives the list of things that are so important to address. But he establishes something. He says, now understand, this place is a place of sacrifice, but if you begin to see these things in the land, if you begin to see the absence of rain, drought in the land, if you begin to see locusts coming and devouring the crops, if you begin to see pestilence in the land, pestilence, sickness, disease in the land, then understand something, Solomon, it's time for you and the people of God to turn. It's time for a change. Something has gone wrong and I have to get your attention. You ever had moments where God had to get your attention? That it became a wake up call. It became a revelation. I'm doing something wrong. God says, "Uh, uh-uh. I'm going to let you know that you need to see some things. I got to get your attention. I got to bring you back. You are out of alignment here. The people of God had come to a place where they were no longer in alignment, even in spite of having such an incredible moment. He points to the fact we see it throughout the nation of Israel. We see those times when they're on fire, where they're passionate, and then we see them drift away. What happened? If you have an encounter with the glory, how can you forget it? If you experience the goodness of God, how could you forget it? If God brings you out, how can you forget it? If God heals your body, how could you forget it? But we tend to live in, what has he done for me lately? And we forget in those moments when we don't seem to see God at work in our life. And here, the nation of Israel went through those moments, those seasons where they made a disconnect. So there are things that they expected of God, but there were were things God expected of them. And there was a disconnect between the people of God and God himself. And God says, now, when you begin to see these things, Say, if I shut up the heavens and there's no rain, if I send locusts, command the locusts to devour the land, if I send pestilence, notice he didn't say, if I had the devil to do it. (laughs) He said, if I do it. In, In moments like this, it's not about rebuking the devil. And in moments like this is recognizing that God is doing something to turn something in us that needs to be readjusted to recognize something about God. That God is readjusting. He's saying, I'm turning the lights on. I'm creating calamity. I'm creating things in your life to set you see something about where you are. In our day, we are seeing. A pandemic, not just not just local, not just translocal, not just regional, not just national, international, global pandemic. There are places in our world that is being confronted by the increase in the devastation of locusts. Isn't that crazy? What's happening? Could it be that the God of the Old Testament is the very same God of the New Testament? And the very same God of the contemporary church. And that God is saying something to his people. Well, you say the world is not his people. But to understand in the world, among the world are his people. And the people are the catalyst to which there can be change in the world. So if my people who are called by my name, my people. The ones who are the city set on the hill, the ones who are the light of the world. If my people will begin to understand their role, their responsibility, their calling, he says, then we can do something. So he says, if my people who are called by my name would begin to make some changes, the first change we need to make, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, the first change is to change our position. Say change our position. We are to change our position from a disposition of arrogance. 
arrogance. What is arrogance? But a, it's an exaggerated view of one's own importance. See, what happens many times that the church gets in trouble is when the church allows itself to be influenced by the culture of the day, by the world system, by the mentality of this age. The world, and the world has no place for God. The world is not functioning in a God-driven mode. The world is saying, we got it, we, we can do it our way, we're gonna have it our way, we're gonna go the way we wanna go. And when the church looks at the world and its independence and begins to envy the world and begins to acquiesce to the world, it steps into a place of arrogance against God. And so he says the first thing you got to do is change your position. You've got to humble yourselves. When you see these things happening, it speaks to the fact that you've been aligning yourself with the mentality of this age and you've been walking in a state of arrogance. And it's one thing to be arrogant toward people, but to be arrogant toward the living God. Not to see him the way he should be seen, that we reduce him and make him co-equal. Rather than seeing him as elevated, high and lifted up. He says now. The first thing, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves. In Psalm 75, the psalmist says this in verse four. I said to the boastful, do not boast. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. Do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with insolent pride. Now, the horn of an animal represented strength. He's saying to the people, don't try to rise up in your own strength. Don't try to act like you can handle and do it all based on your strength. He says this, verse six, for not from the east nor from the west nor from the desert comes exhortation, but God is the judge. He puts down one and he exalts another. He's saying, now understand something. It's in the hand of Almighty God. If you are experiencing increase or blessing, it's because God's done it. But the very same God who can raise you up is the very same God who can pull you down. And if anybody could say this, God can say it. I remember Bill Cosby saying it back in the day toward Theo. I brought you in this world. I can take you out. Well, God is the one who can really say that. I brought you in and I can take you out. God is the one who raises up and God is the one who can pull down. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, change their disposition from arrogance to a place of humility. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, change your position and pray. Change your priorities. Change our priorities. See, prayer speaks about something. It, it communicates something about us. That prayerlessness makes a statement, a statement of self-direction, self-sufficiency, self-reliance. But if we are prayerful, it makes a statement. It makes a statement that we are indeed God-directed, God-controlled, God reliant. So how we function, how we carry ourselves, how we deal with God in prayer makes it a tremendous statement. Prayerlessness is a statement that we can do it independently of God. And so when we are prayerless, then it declares something. It, it positions us to be at a place where we are blinded and deceived because we conclude that we don't need to include God in the affairs of our lives. See, when I pray, I'm saying to God, God, first of all, I acknowledge something. You are God and I'm not. The second thing I acknowledge is I need you, that I need you. And I, the more I pray, I understand how much I need you. I have to pray every day. Give me this day my daily bread that I can't do a day without you. Every day is important, every day is significant. Every day is, is important in, in the light of my dependency upon God. A new mercy met me today. 
And I need God. He's the one who grants me to stay. The fact that you are alive today, that's God all over you. The fact that you got through the night, that was God. The presence and the grace and goodness of God. So he says, if you pray, I'm reminded in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter two and chapter three gives us the seven churches of Asia. And Jesus, the head of the church, is speaking to each one of these churches based on where they are and what they need to hear. And as he's conveying himself to these churches, he starts with the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus was doing great things. They were accomplishing great things. He says, I know your deeds, your toils, your perseverance, how you endure and and how you test those who say they're one thing, but they're not. And you found them to be false. He you are discerning. You are doing what the church should be doing. Wouldn't you want Jesus to say that about your church? But then he says this. But I have one thing against you that you have left your first love. In other words, You have come to a place where you're functioning like the church. You're looking like the church. You're sounding like the church. There's just one major missing element. God. Your dependency on God. And so it's in Revelation chapter three that we see this. And he says this, verse 15. To the church of Laodicea. I know your deeds that you are neither hot nor cold. Now, we talked about the issue of dependency for the church in Ephesus. He goes to the church of Laodicea. The church of Laodicea is a church that is in a city that is thriving. They are experiencing incredible financial success. They are doing well from their perspective. So what happens? As the city is increased, the church is increased. As the prosperity of the city, the prosperity of the church. The church comes to, the city comes to a place where it feels like it has all it needs. The church feels like it has all it needs. The city has come to the place of of security and, and arrogance about what it possesses and what it can do. The church comes to a place of of a sense of arrogance about who it is and what it can do. The spirit of the city became the spirit of the church. And so he says here, I know your deeds that you are neither hot or cold or hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Wow. He says, now I wish that you were on fire Or I wish you would just be at a place where you were separated and distant because you're trying to be at that nauseating place of neutrality. And he says, I I have to spit you out. You ever took a drink of something you expected to be one way and it was something else? He says, that's what he says. That's what this church tastes like to me. And I can't stomach you. Because you're trying to be in the middle. You're you're not in blatant rebellion against me, but you're not all in either. You're just trying to be at that place of just being neutral in God. When I was growing up in in the Baptist church, we used to call it being on the fence. Well, I haven't found the fence yet in the Bible. Either you're going to need to be hot or cold. Come on, recognize where you are. He says now this. He says Because I say to you, or because you say, this is what the church was saying about itself. I am rich. I have become wealthy. I have need of nothing. This is what Jesus' response is. You do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich in white garments so that you can have so you can make clothe yourself and that you that the shame of your nakedness will be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so you may see. In other words, they were blinded to where they were. They were adapting the mentality of the culture that they and they didn't see where they were spiritually. 
They were equating their well-being based on what was happening in the city and all the time what they thought was spiritual in terms of how they assessed themselves was really only natural and in the spirit they were blind and wretched and miserable. And then we see this verse, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now, that verse sometimes is used to share with somebody who doesn't know the Lord about inviting Jesus into your heart. He's standing at the door of your heart and knocking. Okay, okay, I get that. But the context is he's standing at the door of the church. Now, why is the head of the church standing on the, at the door of the church on the outside? He's standing on the outside of the building, knocking on the door because that's the position they put him in. When they said, I don't need, no I need nothing. I don't even need God. He went from having his position as head of the church, now being on the outside, knocking, trying to come in and understand. It talks about the grace and mercy of God. Even when you put him on the outside, he's still coming after you. Can, can you say amen to that? How many times you had moments when you put him on the outside and he was knocking, saying, let me back in. He's knocking. He says, if you open the door, I'll come in and we're dying together because food was a bonding element in the culture of that day. If you had a meal together, it set the stage for fellowship. It set the stage for you to be to make a connection. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, change their position and pray, change their priorities and seek my face, change their pursuits. What's the face of God? It's the will of God. It's the ways of God. It's indeed what God wants. And we discover that there are people who want God's provision, but doesn't want the God of the provision. They want what God can do, but they don't want the God who can do. And see, God doesn't do anything separate from who he is. When I woke up this morning, that was a blessing. But the blessing was, the reason I woke up is because the God of mercy met me today with loving kindness. Yes. Hallelujah. My getting up is inseparable from who he is. As I make it through this day, and, and if God grants me grace to make it, and I get home, and I get in my bed to retire for the night, it's called his faithfulness. Yes. His loving kindness in the morning, his faithfulness by night. Everything God does for us is tied into who and what he is. So I can't just have provision without having the provider. I've got to change my priorities. I've got to be in pursuit of the living God and his way and his will, his plans. Isaiah chapter 55, he says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts higher than yours, says the Lord. See, it's coming to a place every day. I've got to live in the revelation that he's God, that he's God, he's God, he's God, he's God. OK, what does that mean? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. That means his ways are above my ways. And I can't trust in my ways because Proverbs says there's a way that seems right to a man, but it ends in destruction. It ends in devastation. You ever gone your way away from the way of God? You ever get to a place where you say, I'm going to do this. OK, and I know this is not. How many times have I met with people and counseled people? and They say, I know this is not right, but you ever had one of those butt moments? Right. And then you find yourself laying on your butt because you were doing that which is devastating to your own life. There's a way that seems right. It seems right to us. But if we are going to be where God wants us to be, if we're going to be that catalyst of change in a world of darkness, if we're going to be the city on the hill, we've got to be committed to the face of God, the ways of God, the standard of almighty God. 
and recognize his ways are always right. Here's it is. God is always right. Okay, I know maybe hard to digest at times, but God is always right. Absolutely, he's always right. I may not understand his timing all the time. I may not understand the procedures in which he goes and gets us to a certain place. I may not understand why it happens in a certain season. But one thing I know is that God is always right. And you know what? I may not even see the answers in this life. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong to God. There may be things I won't see until I get to heaven. And I go, oh, oh, now I see why this happened. Oh, it's your grace. It's your mercy. If you had done it the way in timetable I wanted to happen, it would have blew up. It would have been crazy. I'm so glad you waited. I'm so glad you did it according to your purpose and your timetable. I'm so glad I didn't have to go through the chaos of my ways if I had trusted in my ways. Now I see why it happened that way. Wow. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And he says, lastly, and turn from their wicked ways. Well, no. Now, what does that tell us? That the people of God were engaged in wicked ways. (laughs) What happens? They begin to act like the culture of the day, like the church can begin to act like the world. Sound like the world, function like the world. See what God is doing. And many times we see it. It's that God has to wake up the church to see where it is because it's been sleeping with the world. And he says, OK, now, if you're going to be that city on a hill, if you're going to if you're going to go and, and be that light in the world, then I've got to shake some things up because it's time for a change. I've got to adjust some things because you sound like the culture. You look like the culture. Your priorities are the priorities of the culture. Your fears are the fears of the culture. You are not living like people who have a revelation of the living God. And so here we see something. John Calvin, great theologian, commentator, uh, great influence in church history. He said this about faith. He said, we are saved by faith alone. And but the faith that saves us is not alone. We are saved by faith alone. But the faith that saves us is not alone. I think Martin Luther would quote that based on John Calvin's statement. But it goes further back than that. It goes back to Ephesians chapter two, because he's saying now understand when you got saved, it was based on faith. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and verse nine, for by grace have you been saved through faith that not of yourself. It's a gift from God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. When you got saved, it's it was faith to receive the grace and goodness of God. It was the gift of God. You don't work for a gift. If you work for a gift, it's not a gift. It's payment. You don't work for salvation. So the faith that saves you, you are saved by faith alone. But that faith that saves you is not alone. What is he saying? Just like the Apostle Paul. He says, now, not by works that you can boast. You can't boast about the fact I got myself saved. I did it. I did enough to appease God. I did enough that God is happy with me. No, you can never say that. It's God taking a step to pay the price for us to redeem us in spite of us and love us and grant us salvation. He took the initiative toward us. That's why we call it grace. That's the sign of the hearing impaired for grace is God coming to you, not you going to God. There is nothing in us. There's none who is righteous. No, not no one is good. We didn't pursue God. God came after us. How many know God ran you down? God got you. (laughs) I mean, no, there was nothing in you that wanted God. Even if you grew up in church, it was still God coming after you. And so there are those who would say, "Okay, pastor, that's it. I'm saved by grace. It's the faith of God, faith in God by grace. I'm saved. It's not by works. Hallelujah. That's it. And that's how some Christians take it and go with it. Okay, so I'm saved. I received Christ in my life. It's by faith. Amen. That's it. And and I'm a believer. And that's it. I believe in Christ. It's grace. I got the gift. Amen. 
But John Calvin said the faith that saves us, we're saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves us is not alone. Paul said, for by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not as a result of works, that you can't boast about it. And then verse 10, he says, for we are the workmanship of God, created in Christ Jesus, ready for this? Created for good works, which he's prepared beforehand. That means I don't do good works to get saved, but now that I'm saved, I do good works. I live for the glory of God. My ways are his ways. I live according to his plan. And so if I'm a Christian, there will be clear, definable evidence in my lifestyle that my allegiance belongs to Jesus because I will have corresponding works that reveal the integrity of my faith. You get that? So if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then God says, I'll do something. Oh, my gosh. We want God to do this. He says, if my people will do this, he says, I will do this. If they do what they need to do, I'll do this. He said, number one, I would hear from heaven. Are you telling me that it's possible for us to pray and God not hear us? Huh. Isaiah 59 says this. It is not that his hands are so short that they can't save. It's not that his ears are so dull that he can't hear. But he says, your sin has made a separation between you and God. So you could begin to pray, but because of all the stuff and the insincerity and all the lack of conviction and the lack of repentance that you're talking and God will not hear you because of all the stuff that's in between you and him. He says, if you do this, I'll know the state of your heart and you're genuine and you really want change. And if you change, I can change the things around you. And I would hear your prayer. He says, I'll hear. If my people were called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I would hear from heaven. I would forgive their sins. Wow, wait a minute. You mean forgiveness hangs in a balance based on the level of my sincerity and my conviction. Why would God forgive somebody who's not serious about being forgiven? Why would God give, forgive somebody who's not really genuine about living up now to the implications of being forgiven? He says, now, if you're really serious and you're going to ready to invest yourself in putting me first, then I can allow there to be the remission of sins in the context of your relationship and your walk with me. See, it's not the person who says, God, forgive me for what I'm about to do. OK, now that's not you expect God to forgive you when you still have an intention to do something. He says, I would hear from heaven, forgive your sins. And then he says this. I would heal your land. I would heal the land. It's not the onus is not on the world to heal the land. The onus is on the people of God. We're the ones that have the connection with God. We're the ones that have a relationship with God. We are the voice of God in our day. We are the revelation of his nature. We represent God and all. He speaks to us. We speak to him. We're the ones that can usher in healing into the land. Maybe this season of time is all about the church coming to a place of where it should be. I'm not talking about the world and all the sin in the world and mass things getting crazier and crazier and definitions of being redone and adding more things onto this and on the dark. And I'm not. That happens. It's the world. I'm talking about when the church tolerates it, accepts it and mimics it. God says, uh, -uh. no, 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 no. I've got to begin to get your attention. So I'm going to let it rain on the just and the unjust. I'm going to let things happen until the church can wake up and recognize it's time to change. Tell somebody time for a change. Come on, stand with me. Hallelujah. I 
I don't know where you are in this moment, but I understand we talk about the church and the church should not be reduced to just the concept of an institutional gathering. The church is a community of believers, but that community is composed of individuals. And did you know that we saw in the Bible that one man's sin held up the release of an entire camp to get to where God wanted to go? So each of us bears a responsibility. Each of us have to be in a place of alignment with God. And I believe that our blessings, the things we do in obedience affects one another. The things we do in disobedience affects one another. What would happen if we begin to rise up in obedience and trust and faith with God? That person next to you will be blessed. I said that person next to you will be blessed by your obedience, your faith, your yielding to God. So many times God's doing something not just to get me where he wants me to go. He's getting me to a place so I can be the instrument that God can use to bless somebody else because I faith, my, my trust, my belief is indeed releasing something in the atmosphere of their development. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me pray with you just before Minister Wendy comes and closes us out, transitions us. Maybe we just need to take a moment right now and say, God, where am I? Do I need to change my position? Do I need to change my priorities? Do I need to change my pursuits? Do I need to change my practices? Could I be instrumental in your voice, in your ways happening in this time and hour to cause the church in the world to wake up to a revelation of the living God? If so, God, I want to get out of me what needs to go. I want to release from me that is a hindrance. I want to be in sync with your purpose. I want to be an open vessel for your glory. Let the glory cloud. Let the presence of God fill us like never before. God, we are creating a sacrifice. I'm sacrificing my pride. I don't need it. I'm sacrificing my self-sufficiency. I don't need it. I'm sacrificing my ways. I'm giving you a sacrifice. Why? Because I want your fire to come down. I want your glory to be revealed. Take a moment. Just, be, just you and God right now. And just take a moment and talk to the Lord. And then I'll pray in a moment. You go ahead and talk to the Lord. Father, we come before you and we are so glad that you changed us. We're so glad that you did a work in us. And we're saying that we don't ever want to go back. We don't ever want to go back into the place of disorder and confusion and chaos. You've been too good to us. And Father, maybe in this period of time, some things that have been latent in us have come to the surface, things that you wanted to expose so we could be healed. Wrong attitudes and wrong feelings and wrong approaches to things and limitations that we put on you, dear God. Maybe this period of time is so significant to get us to where we need to be. Maybe, dear God, in the midst of it, we've been cloaked with this concern and that concern and 
And maybe we had to deal with an issue that was so big it caused us to see how, how small those things were. Maybe, dear God, maybe we were even cloaked with a fear of death to the point, dear God, that we lost sight of how glorious heaven would be. Oh God, we come and say, forgive us. Forgive us, dear God. You said you would hear us if we're genuine. We are coming in a genuine heart, dear God. We lay down all the things that would be an affront to you and we say, forgive us. Father, we, we want your ears. We want your heart. We want your mind. We say, forgive us, dear God. And then we say, Father, do something. Begin to heal this land. Begin to sweep in upon these cities, these counties. Begin to sweep in upon this country. Begin to sweep on in, dear God, globally, dear God. Let there be such a move, dear God. We thank you for doctors and scientists, and we thank you for vaccines. And, but Father, unless the Lord builds a house, we labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, we're not safe. We need you, O oh God, to do what only you can do. So meet us, O oh God. Heal the land. Grant us rain again. Remove the locusts. Remove the pestilence. God, meet us by your Holy Spirit. We cry out, O oh God, for a move of your spirit. Send the fire down, O oh God. For your glory, dear God, purify, cleanse, and refresh us. Father, we take a moment, we lift our hands, and we just begin to give you the praise that's due your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worthy. Worthy. Jesus. You're holy, you're glorious, you're wonderful, you're magnificent. We extol your name. Well, we serve an awesome God this morning, amen? If you're grateful, if you're truly, truly grateful for the word of the Lord this morning, and how God used our lead pastor, please just give him a shout of praise, a clap on your hands, hallelujah. If you are at home watching us online, we thank God for you this morning. We want you to give God a shout as well, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It's at this time of our service that we uh, never want to miss an opportunity to give people that opportunity to give their lives to the Lord. Amen. So if you're here visiting with us for the first time and you don't know the Lord, we are thankful that you're here. But we just want to give you that opportunity at the end of the service. Our um, altar counselors will be to my right, your left. And online, you too have an opportunity to give your life to the Lord. We just let our online hosts know what your situation is, and they will be there to pray for you. And not only do we want to give you an opportunity to give your life to the Lord, but some of you may be in a situation where you truly do need a change. You've given yourself to God in the past, but you know you're not doing exactly what he desires of you. So you too will have an opportunity to get that right, to turn that around, to rededicate, amen? And if you're here and God led you to hear one thing we know, that if you are here, it is not by accident. You're here because the Holy Spirit brought you in this place. And so if you believe this is the place God would have you to be a member, you'll have that opportunity as well. Hallelujah. Even for those of you who are watching at home online, if you want to be a part of Crossover Church, again, you would just let the online host know in the chat room and they will indeed pray for you. And I'm just so thankful and grateful that... Since this uh, pandemic and the quarantine and us having to go online and do services, God has really truly met us. We have indeed had 
people join our church. That's awesome. You ought to give God some praise. Awesome. People joining, loving God, honoring Him in their giving, all of that. That is a move of God. Hallelujah. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we want to connect with you. If you're here in the building, there's a card on the seat, on the back of the seat in front of you. Please fill that out and drop it in the lobby. And if you're visiting with us online, just let us know that you're that you enjoyed the service, whatever the situation is, and we will indeed connect with you. Amen. Amen. We also want to give you an opportunity to give back to God. God has been good. Amen. God has been good. At the beginning of the year, we had a saying uh, initiated by our lead pastor that this will be our best year yet, 2020. The best year ever. Amen. And I'm going to hang on to that. And in that, many of you have been blessed to be able to continue to work from home, whatever. Don't turn your back on God. I don't know if you recognize that, but again, God has been good. So honor him. Honor him with your increase. Honor him with the fruits of those things that he's been placing in your hands. Amen. So we want to bless the Lord with the tithe, the offering, and the building fund. And so now we just want to close and seal out this awesome word that our pastor brought forth this morning. Amen. If you would, extend your hands towards heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you. We love you this morning, God, and we are grateful. We are glad to first and foremost be alive this morning and be among the living, oh God. And Father, we don't want when we say we love you to just be lip service, oh God. Help us to show it in our actions, oh God. So Father, as we leave this place, as we go into service this week, Lord, remind us of your word this morning. Remind us, oh God, of the word, time for change. God, we don't want to stay the same. We want to be yielded vessels so that you can do the good work that you've already begun. Lord, we want you to complete it till the day of Christ Jesus. So, Father, as we leave this place this morning, just continue to speak to our hearts to stir us up oh God hallelujah to bring that fresh wind and that fresh fire oh God that we so desperately need God we want your glory cloud to fall on us oh God not those not just while we're here oh God but when we leave this place in our homes those that are watching online oh God Fill their homes with your glory this morning, God. Do that mighty, mighty, mighty work that you want to do, God. But it's going to take yielded vessels. So we yield to you now. We love you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We pray over the giving this morning, Lord. We pray over the tithe, the offering, the building fund, oh God. We thank you for those gifts. We thank you for the ability to give back to you a tenth, oh God. We thank you, oh God, for the ability to give back above the tithe, oh Lord, which is a love offering, oh God. And we thank you, Lord, for faith to sow into the building fund. We thank you, God, for the ability to sow seeds of faith, oh God. So, Father, with our hands lifted up, oh God, and our mouths filled with praise, hallelujah, we just want to bless you and honor your name. So we give you glory and let the church of God say amen. God bless you. God bless you as you leave.
You can't pimp slap nobody? <laughs> uh, nah, that, that ain't no pimp slap. That's going to knock you out. <laughs> that, that's like the brass knuckle. Uh, that's like the brass knuckle one that did. Yeah, that's ain't nice, though. Y'all have a great one as well. Oh, yeah, I can. Yeah, man. That's very nice.